good to have you here with us. Isaiah chapter 43 in the Word of God this morning, Isaiah chapter 43. Uh, around nine and a half years ago, my family and I, we were uh, in Hawaii, and uh, we were going through the airport in Hawaii, getting ready to board our plane, and I came a little across a little kiosk, and they were selling uh, seeds for plumeria trees, plumeria plants. I bought a packet of those seeds. There was 12 of them in there. Uh, and then a few months later, after we got back to the, the States and, you know, I was able to get some potting soil and different things, I planted those. And out of those 12 seeds, every one of them sprouted. And out of those 12 seeds, there's only two plants left. I gave them to different people. Uh, and everybody I've given one to, they've all killed them. So I'm not giving away plants anymore. Like, like you know, they're savage, right? It's just wrong. <laughs> They're meant to be, uh, you know, maintained and see a growth in life. But nine and a half years ago, I planted that seed. And if you go to the next slide, two days ago, we got our very first flower. That one flower, yes, that one flower is nine and a half years in the making. That's crazy to think, right? So the, the tree's about this tall now, about, you know, mid, mid chest height, to about six, four and a half feet or so, five feet. And uh, there's seven flowers starting to bloom, but that was the very, very first one. And I use that as an illustration this morning because uh, God wants to bring new things to pass in our lives. And sometimes that takes time. It doesn't happen instantly. It doesn't, you know, just open up overnight. Like I have pictures of this flower starting to bud, starting to grow. It took about five days for this thing to open up. And it's just now, this wasn't fully completely open. And it's just now fully completely open this morning when I went out there and looked at it. But it even took time for the flower itself to open. It wasn't just an overnight process. And the reason I'm using that as an illustration this morning is because a lot of times we want God to do things in our lives that are fresh, exciting, and new, but we don't want to give God the time to bring it to pass. We don't want to give God that, the opportunity to, to, to bring and put the things in motion, take the steps that it's going to take to get us somewhere and to bring us to that place where we can experience a newness in God. If you're there this morning, let's read Isaiah 43 as we consider a new thing springing forth. Uh, out of Isaiah 43, we're going to begin in verse 15. The Word of God says this. Uh, it says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. This is a reference uh, to them going through the Red Sea. He opened up the Red Sea so that they could cross through the waters. Who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished and are quenched like a wick. That's a reference to when God brought the waters back in on the armies of Egypt as they chased them through the Red Sea, God extinguished them. He put their light out as he brought the waters back in. You know, it's amazing. You can go and you can do the research now. They've actually found the chariot wheels uh, in the water where they crossed the Red Sea. There's still evidence of this to this day. It exists. Verse 18, uh, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. I'm asking that you would bring a newness of life. Uh, God, that you would help us to rest in you and to trust in you to bring a fresh work uh, to pass in our marriages, in our finances, in our physical bodies, God, in our minds and our emotions. God, I'm asking you to break forth in a new way. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to think with me, first of all, this morning about the need for the new. Uh, in our text, God, he's preparing people's hearts for a fresh and a new work in their life. Uh, he's trying to get them to understand that he is at work. There's a lot of times where God is working on our behalf in areas that we don't see yet. 
We don't fully understand all that God has to do to move things in motion, to get people to a certain place in their life where they will receive the word of God. Sometimes that is a behind the scenes work that we don't even realize God is working on our behalf. Listen, and God's making reference here in our text to the people of Egypt uh, that were slaves. He brought them through the Red Sea. He destroyed the army, giving them total and complete and deliverance so that they had an opportunity to start a new life. How many of you uh, want to have that new life in Jesus this morning? Amen? That means we're going to have to confront some things, though. We're going to have to talk to Pharaoh. We're going to have to uh, walk through the wilderness. We're going to have to look, be up against the Red Sea and look that barrier in the face uh, and overcome those challenges in Jesus. We're going to have to walk by faith. I mean, it was probably pretty scary to walk through the water when you know, hey, I don't know how to swim. I've spent my whole life in the desert, and now God has me crossing an ocean, and I got water on either side of me. That must have been pretty intense. That must have been a, a, a rather uh, you know, intense emotional thing where they had to just say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to walk by faith here. But with that, God is saying that you don't have to be a slave any longer. God is saying you don't have to have that old lifestyle. You don't have to live the way that you've always lived. You can have a newness of life, a fresh life. For us today, that means that we don't have to be slaves to the world. We don't have to be given over to sin. We don't have to live according to our flesh any longer. I remember when I got saved and somebody, uh, you know, dealt with me about a sin issue that I had in my life. It was very uh, apparent. It was wide open. Everybody could see that I was smoking cigarettes. I was, you know, still holding on to things. And I remember when somebody came up to me and said, hey, man, God can set you free from that. Like he can deliver you. But I had never thought about that before in my life. I, I was raised with grandparents that smoked. Uh, you know, at five years old, I had my first cigarette. Like there was just things that uh, we're just that that was life. That was how you live. This is, you know, when you're stressed, what do you do? You have a cigarette, right? That was how I grew up. That was uh, what I learned. But to, to hear at a new place in my life, 19 years old, to have somebody come up to me and say, hey, you don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to behave that way anymore. You don't have to respond out of your emotions. You don't have to vent and get mad and throw punches at people, right? You don't have to do that anymore. That was all new to me. That didn't make sense to me. But God was moving in a way where I realized God's trying to bring me to a place of maturity. He's trying to move me forward in life. He doesn't want me stuck in slavery and bondage, having to, to cope with things the way I've always dealt with them. In verse 18, God, he says, forget the former things. So what God is saying is like, listen, the, the way that you've lived in the past You've got to move beyond that. You've got to not bring that with you. I'm going to deliver you, but you've got to leave those ways behind so that you can have a new life. You can live a new way. You can behave a new way. You can think a new way. You can respond to things a new way. I want to give you a new life, but that means you're going to have to forget the former things. You know, to be free from the bondage of sin, you have to change the way you think about things. That's one of the beginning and foundational steps is I'm going to approach life differently now. I'm going to look at things differently. I'm no longer a victim because I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm set free. I'm a victor, not a victim. I'm a victor. I have victory in my life. I can walk in that confidence now. I can know that Jesus is on my side, that he loves me and he's delivered me. And I don't have to have those old ways of thinking. We have to purposely decide that we are not going to approach life the old way, but we're going to approach life the new way. And you know what that means is you're going to have to do a little bit of research. Like God, if I have an anger problem, God, show me how to deal with anger. Like there's a lot of anger examples in the Bible, right? Moses, he struck the rock. He was angry at the people, and so he lashed out because of his frustration. We have Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. He pulled a sword and he cut the ear off of the, the, the guard as they were arresting Jesus. So, so how did God deal with these men? We can look at that and we can see that with, with Moses, it cost him destiny. He wasn't able to enter the promised land 
because he had an emotional outburst. And we can learn every emotional outburst will cost us something. It will keep us from what God has for us. So I better learn to get my heart in check. Peter, he heard from Jesus himself. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Basically, what he was saying is, Peter, if you're going to be aggressive and attack and and behave that way, there's going to be consequences that come back into your life. So we've got to learn how to use some verbal judo, right? De-escalation. We've got to see, like, God is a God of peace. So if there's an aggression, if there's something going on, maybe I need to handle it in a peaceful way. You know, it's, it's amazing when we start to look at marriage things, God tells us in marriage, love one another. Right. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Consider the other person before yourself. Uh, He tells us that uh, if if there's a a one that's an unbeliever, that we have to through our the way we live through our lifestyle, we have to convince them that God is real. And that's not going to come by arguing. That's going to come by allowing them to see God use your life to bring forgiveness, grace and mercy to their life. But that's a process that takes time that That's a conscious decision of, I'm not going to trade railing for railing right now, but I'm going to trade railing for mercy. I may receive railing, but I'm going to give back love. I may receive harshness, but I'm going to give back mercy. I'm going to give back kindness for the the thing, the bitter waters that I'm having to drink. I'm not going to throw that back in their face, but I'm going to put back in their face a sweet, tender response because I want to see it shift. I want to see it change. But God's got to have room to work. Amen? If you trade railing for railing in relationships, you're not giving God room to work on that other person. Like Jesus actually said, when someone's mean and harsh to you and you treat them with kindness, it's as though you're heaping hot coals on their head. What that's the imagery of is taking coals out of the fire and putting it literally on somebody's head. That's affecting their thoughts. I don't know what's going on right now. Why are you being so nice to me? And you're, you're starting to get to their thoughts. And they realize, man, maybe I, maybe I am too mean. Maybe I am too harsh. And, but you've got to give God room to work, approaching life in a new way so that God can do a new work. Luke 9, verse 62, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So what, what Jesus is giving us, the image, is a, it's a farming, right? So you have a, a cow, an ox that's helping you to pull the plow through the ground and breaking it up. He's saying as you're going through and you're breaking up the new soil, you're breaking up the ground and preparing it to plant something new, don't be looking back all the time, right? Because then all of a sudden your rows are going to start looking like, like this, right? If you're going to have that you're going to be productive. You've got to pay, be paying attention to what's coming, what the, the direction you're moving in that forward trajectory. It's very easy, though, to forget and to misunderstand what God is doing for our lives, especially when we're getting caught up and we're running into the rocks of life, right? Man, that wasn't supposed to be there. That wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, you know, and we can, in the middle of that struggle, of trying to pry out that situation and work through it, We can forget like what Jesus is really actually at work doing. The bigger picture. He's made a way for us to be totally free. In verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing and now it shall spring forth. So God is saying that we can experience life in a new and living way if we'll allow him to work for us. This brings us secondly to the the reality that we need a new spirit. So Changing our thought life, but also changing the spirit of who we are, right? The spirit is uh, one way of saying this is it's, uh, uh, it's the aroma of our heart. It's the, who we are. Uh, what, what, what are we bringing into the room? Are, have you ever had someone walk into the room and you just like instantly know like, oh my gosh, it's going to get ugly because they have that look on their face. They have that, you could sense their spirit like, oh, <laughs> here we go. Okay. Are you ready for crazy? Put your seatbelt on because they just walk crazy, just walk through the door. But what he's saying there is that, uh, you know, in in our lives, we can take this newness of spirit. And when we walk into a room, people are like, man, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. You bring a life. You bring a joy. Uh, Recently, uh, one of our vehicles, uh, you know, we went out there to start up the the car and click, 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 click. 
click, click, nothing's happening, realized, hey, the battery's shot, jumped it, started right up, took it over to the auto parts store, they threw their tester on there, yep, your battery's dead, go in, drop in a brand new battery, hook it up, boom, and off we go the way we're supposed to. You know, there's things, there's times in our lives where we need a fresh battery. We need a fresh source of life. We need a fresh power that we're drawing from, a place where we can actually bring life in because the old one is click, 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 click. It's not working right anymore. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I know we use that scripture a lot in the Christian world, right? All things become new. Old things passed away. But it can become cliche, but it's so powerful when we really allow that to saturate into our hearts that God, I want to be that new person. I want to have those old things, those old ways put, put away from me. I don't want to live the way I used to live. It's very easy, though, to slip into those old mindsets, the old life, uh, the carnal ways, uh, the stubborn ways, uh, the unbelieving mindsets. It's very easy to come again to a place of a challenge, a brick wall, however you're dead end, however you want to term it. It's very easy to come to that place in life where you just oh, you start to respond in that old way. And we have to learn to change that behavior. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The, f- the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak are uh, to you are spirit and they are life. So one of the things that we can do, and again, so foundational, but so easily overlooked, is that we can get the power of God into our lives simply by reading his word. God, I want my spirit to match your spirit, so that means I've got to get into it. I've got to get into your word. I've got to find out where your heart is at, where your mind is at, what your thoughts are on this. But God, that means I need to get your word into my heart so that I can have your spirit as part of my spirit, the dominating part of my spirit. I mean, we need to get our old spirit put away and the new spirit that God has for us Put in Romans 8, verse 9, it says, uh, uh, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, uh, he is not God's. We need the Spirit of Christ to be the dominating Spirit of our lives. And that's simply inviting God in, giving God access, giving God dominion. God, you're in control. God, you have right of way in my life. What you say, God, is what's going to go. It's going to be how I approach my situations that I'm dealing with. I'm going to do it from the mind of God, the spirit of God, the heart of God, and not my way anymore. But part of that is just allowing God access, opening the word of God. The Bible is filled with examples of people who walked with God, who wrestled with God, who allowed God to have control of their lives. Luke verses 9.55, it says... uh, but, but God turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. So here's Jesus. He's turning and he's talking to these people because there was something going on. They were walking with Jesus. They were in the presence of God. He's talking to them and he's literally saying like, yes, you are a Christian. You're following me. You're doing, but you have a spirit that is not correct in this particular situation. And Jesus says, listen, you have to get this spiritual side in order. If you're going to make it through this, you're going to have to allow me to change your spirit here, to give you a newness of heart, a newness of life. This brings us uh, uh, thirdly to to springing forth. Uh, my, uh, My mom sent me a picture of some trees and they were, uh, you know, changing colors and, uh, you know, they just moved from Arizona up to Idaho and she sends me some pictures and she's like, Hey, uh, I guess springtime comes a little bit later up here. And so it was all these trees that were dead, you know, they were in hibernation for winter. And all of a sudden there's these bright, vivid green little buds popping out everywhere. It's a newness of life. The new leaves are coming And she says, I'm looking forward to 
the fall time when all these will turn the oranges and the yellows and the purples and the reds. Uh, I want to see all of the seasons. Uh, and you know what, what she was talking about is, is that there in life, there are going to be seasons where things change. The atmosphere changes. The temperature changes. Uh, the, the, the visuals that we see, they're going to change. Uh, and in life, we can look forward to what God wants to do in changing areas of our life. One thing that people don't like, though, is we don't like change, right? I got a routine. I get up every morning at the same time. I eat the same breakfast. I drink the same coffee uh, out of the same cup. Uh, I put on the same shoes, uh, uh, you know. I need to make sure that the left sock goes on the left foot, the right sock goes on the right. Like some people are very OCD, right? Some people, they don't care. They wear two totally different socks, and they're fine with it. But for the most part, as human beings, we're programmed that we don't, we don't really like change very much. You know, do you want to try a new restaurant? No, why would I ever try a new restaurant? I have a restaurant that I like already. But change is actually a really good thing when it's in the right ways. Here God is dealing, in our text, He's dealing with the people about a change in their life that they needed to make. They needed to see some new things come to pass in their life. And this is what church and Christianity are all about. Can you say amen? I come to church so that I can hear from God. I was in church last night on a Saturday night so that I could hear from God because I don't want my life to just stay stagnant because I know standing water, nothing good grows in it, right? It just, it gets gross. It starts to smell. It starts to breed life that's not supposed to be there. Things that will harm and be bacteria, like if, 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 I, if I want the change, I want fresh waters. I want fresh life. And so that means I need to stay connected in the right way. Many times the changes that God wants to bring to us, they don't make sense to us at first. Sometimes God's going to come and say, hey, I want to move in your life in this way. And your first response is, that's impossible. I don't think God could save that person. I don't think God could change that person. I don't think I could ever get over that hurt and that violation in my life. That's too radical, God. I know who I am and I cannot forgive. I know who I am and I cannot do that, whatever that is, right? God will challenge us to move out of comfort zones. He'll challenge us to change in new ways. But we have to trust God. He said in our text, behold, I will do a new thing. Something that you haven't seen yet. A new thing is literally a new thing. Right? It's, it's something that's going to be outside of what is normal for you. God wants to work in a new way. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? So God is basically saying, listen, you're going to know when I'm working on your behalf. You're going to see a shift begin to change. He said, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So God brings them through the Red Sea, brings them out of Egypt. He brings them into this valley where they're hemmed in on every side, runs them right to the, the Red Sea, and now there's just water. The armies are coming behind them, and then he opens the, the Red Sea. They cross through the waters, and when they get to the other side, the waters come back in. And now they're there in a place they've never been. But if you look on a map, if you research this area, it's just barrenness. It's just desert, man. It's Saudi Arabia. And it's just dirt and rocks and snakes and scorpions and, and vultures. Like, it's not a pretty place. But God brings them to where Mount Sinai is. It's not the Mount Sinai you can open your Bible and look in the map there. It's, that's not the real Mount. That's where the Catholics believe Mount Sinai is, but when we look historically, we find the archaeological evidence. Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, where the actual text tells us it is. They found it, Mount Jabal, and you can go there if you can get permission from the Saudi Arabia government, and you can actually see a rock where it has been split open, and there's evidence that water filled that area underneath it, and it was enough water to be able to take care of and maintain three million people. That's exactly what God did. So it's all still there. We can still look at this and see the evidence of what God did. And God was saying, listen, I'm going to take what's impossible and I'm going to make it possible for you. 
so that you can survive, so that you could be set free. God not only wants us to be free, but he wants us, he wants to give us favor. God wants to give us provision. When God fulfills his promises, God does it in a miraculous way, yes, but he does it in a way that's abundant. He doesn't just give us barely enough. He gives us extra. God goes beyond. God does supernatural things because he is a supernatural God. And what God promises, God fulfills. Why don't you say that with me? What God promises, God fulfills. And it's so true that we, a, a lot of times we'll miss what God is trying to do for us because we're missing the reality that, God, you've promised me this. And I'm going to believe you to fulfill it. And that might take some time, but we can still have that confidence that, God, you are going to fulfill it. Exodus 17, 6, Behold, I will uh, stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, uh, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, and the people and my people uh, will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God brought it to pass. He struck the rock with his, with his rod, it split and water came forward and the people of God were taken care of. God tells Moses to do something that no one else has ever seen or done before. What do you mean? I'm going to hit a rock and all of a sudden just that is going to bring forth water. God says, just watch. I'm okay with doing the impossible. God wants to move. God wants to help. And this is when God uh, tells us to do impossible things with our lives that we have to step out in faith. What do you mean, God? What do you, what do you mean you're going to save that person, touch that person, work in that, heal that situation? God will enable and he'll strengthen you if you'll respond in faith. In John 7, verse 38 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The first place that the living water, the life needs to happen is in our heart. The first place where change needs to take place is within our own spirit. God, I need the freshness of God. I need that living water to break forth in my heart. That's going to start with daily prayer, daily uh, Bible reading. In Luke 11, verse 3, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. And so going to God every single day saying, God, I need you to sustain me, to keep me, to give me that life so that I can move forward in you. And God will do that. The second practical application here is don't talk about the old sinful ways in a glamorous light. A lot of times we'll, we'll, we'll talk about who we used to be before Jesus, but we make it exciting like it was something that was fun to do. And especially I've made very, very, I've been very careful with my kids. Like I'll tell them, you know, that they see a tattoo on my arm. What's that, daddy? That's a mistake. I'll tell them like, hey, I'll be really honest with them about it. Yes, I did drink. I did smoke marijuana. I did do drugs, but it was foolish. It wasn't fun. I was always sick afterwards. And I'll be very, very clear that I'm not glamorizing something that I don't want to ever go back to myself. And I don't ever want to see my kids and the people around me caught up in again. Our text, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. So he's saying, don't even allow that on your radar that, hey, why don't I go back to that? Why don't I go back to that old way of living? Why don't I go back to that old life? The final thing that we can do is listen to God's voice and take action on it. God's not going to tell you to do harmful things. So if you ever hear that little voice and it's telling you to go do something that you know is a sin or that you know is self-destructive, that's going to bring pain and sorrow, that's not the voice of God. But if God is telling you to step out in faith and do something that you can see when you think a little bit, you got to turn your, your brain on, right? God, I can see that you're challenging me, but you're challenging me for the good. You're stretching me in faith. You're encouraging me to go beyond. And that could be to have a conversation with somebody about Jesus that you've always been afraid to have a conversation with to confront a family member about a certain thing in life, to deal with issues in your own hearts. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's used a lot of times as an offering scripture. But seek first the, things, the kingdom of God, 
What are all the other things that could be added unto you? A family member saved, a spouse saved, right? A, a, a physical healing that you might need, a, a mental deliverance that you need, an addiction that, that you need to be broken and delivered of. If you'll seek God first, God can add deliverance, transform the situation and bring healing. Friend, God wants to do the new thing in your life, but we've got to believe him for it. And that begins where we just say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in confidence that you're going to move in my life in a new and living way. God, I want to I see you at work. I remember when, uh, and I'll close with this story, uh, when my family and I uh, started going to the, the church in Prescott, Arizona, uh, we had come back from overseas and, and uh, we're sitting in our seat. We'd kind of sit in the same area. I remember there was a woman there. Her name is Nancy Renz. And Nancy would come and she was a super kind and super sweet, always very uh, friendly. And she'd shake our hands. And, but I, I noticed she was there by herself all the time. And she had, you know, there would be different ladies that would sit with her, single women, or she'd sit with different families. But I remember she'd come and go by herself all the time. And so I, I, you know, I was just curious, you know, hey, what's the deal with Nancy? You know, like uh, she's always so happy, but she's always by herself. And someone began to tell me, yeah, pray for her. Pray for her husband, Brian. He's been backslidden. He's been away from Jesus for close to 40 years. He was a pastor in our fellowship and they had gone out, they had started a church. Like if there's somebody that knows the deal, it's, you know, it's this guy, but yet he doesn't want to serve God right now. He's, he's just living his life. He's doing his thing. And he was a good guy. He was a good husband. He was there, uh, but, but still, uh, you know, uh, he wasn't right with God. And so I just asked her one day, you know, she sat down in front of us and I said, hey, Nancy, what's your husband's name? I want to start praying for him. And she started, just broke out in tears. She said, please, yes, pray for him. She goes, I love him, but he needs Jesus bad. And so, I, okay, and I wrote his name down, Brian Renz, and I'm going to just start praying for him. Like three weeks later, Nancy comes walking in. She's glowing, man. And I'm not saying my prayers made that big of a difference, but I'm just saying God began to do a fresh work. She walks in and she's glowing. And I look and I'm like, what the heck? You know, like Nancy's excited. She's always happy, but this is like happy on another level, right? And then I, I see she's got a, a man with her and I'm thinking maybe her brother, you know, that was kind of like, I'm praying for her husband, but you know, I'm just kind of, he's taller than her. He's just this dynamics, you know, but he kind of had his guard up. You could tell he was very guarded in this situation and he comes walking in and sits down and uh, right in front of us sits down and so I introduce him hey my name is Matt what's your name he goes I'm Brian and instantly it clicked I'm like yes God can do it and that morning he gave his life to Jesus and he's still one of my one of my best friends because from that point on we started to have a friendship uh, uh, God just began to, to move in this man's life. He's the head of the security team. He, he's, he heads up all the maintenance at the church now. But for close to 10 years now, he's been sold out for Jesus, just, just giving it 100%. But, but listen, for 40 years, he had a wife that was praying for him, that was contending for his salvation, was believing God. But God was working behind the scenes. And finally, what it was, uh, you know, I just asked Brian, I said, man, what was it that made the, 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 the change? What was it that brought the difference? He said, I just got tired of fighting God. I just got tired of fighting Jesus. And I figured if you can't beat him, you might as well join him. <laughs> kind of a no-nonsense guy. But the reality of it was is that God was working. God got a hold. God did the impossible. If God can do that for Nancy and Brian Renz, God can do it for you. And whatever it might be, the situation that you're facing, whatever situation that you're going through personally, emotionally, relationship-wise, I want to just encourage you to, to bring it to God and say, God, maybe I haven't prayed about this in a while. Sometimes it's hard to pray consistently when you're not seeing it happen. But maybe come back with a fresh heart this morning and say, God, I haven't brought this to you in a while, but I really need a miracle. God, I haven't been looking at this situation with faith. 
I've been looking at this situation with doubt, but God, I'm going to believe you to do a new thing today. God, I'm going to believe you because your word, and this is, this is, I want to encourage you, this is how you should pray. God, you have said, and hold God at his word. God, you said that if I'll ask, God, you said that if I'll seek you, God, you said that you're going to do a new thing, that you're going to bring forth life in the desert. You're going to bring the impossible to pass. God, I'm coming to you with an impossible task right now because you're the only one that can do it, and I'm going to believe you to do the new thing that needs to take place so that I could see this deliverance, this healing. And line that heart that you have for whatever the situation is, line it up with God and bring it to God and just say, God, I'm going to trust you to do it because you are a God of new beginnings, of fresh starts. God, you're a God that makes a way through the rivers. God, you're, you're the one that brings new, newness to life. You bring rivers out of rocks uh, and fresh life out of the desert. You bring, make roads in the world. God, you can work in this situation. And God will help you. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning out of respect of God and those around you.